I'm Tao Ha, and I am a professor of sociology at Miracosta College. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Thanks for coming on. Um, so what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you nowadays? Uh, today, um, man, it means so many things because for me, uh, I think I've lived, uh, I guess I'm at midlife. <laughs> so, uh, so many decades and each time a generation passes, it means something different or you add on to your, your life experience. So it means that, uh, you know, as a refugee, there, you, I'm tied to war, right? I'm tied to conflict. Um, I'm tied to uh, thinking about my family and the uh, the journey of like trauma and healing, right? Um, and uh, it means trying to navigate uh, American life, right? As like different uh, ways of being, right? Being Vietnamese, being American, being Asian, being female, like so. Um, yeah, it means. Uh, I think the best way I would capture it is it means you have to navigate and you kind of figure yourself around in different spaces and different environments. And each of those have uh, nuances that you have to kind of figure out and so that you can find your place. I think when you're young, you're trying to figure out, you know, where you belong and right. who you are. And now you think you figured out, but really you haven't. <laughs> you're still figuring it out. <laughs> or at least I am. <laughs> I think we all, we all are. I think, um, even, I mean, that's probably why I do this podcast is to continually figure out who I am. It's a very selfish endeavor. Mm -hmm. So before I was ever introduced to you, I've heard about you for many years. I mean, um, it's like <laughs> the film community and sort of like the people that we exist in. So my friends, um, we exist in a, in a little bubble but we hear about names all the time. So throughout the years, you hear these names like uh, Sea Drift and uh, Dr. Tao. Um, but I also knew that uh, you came with a very different history than what my mind is used to, right? Because anytime I see a PhD that's attached to a name, I think of somebody in a, in a very classroom setting, somebody who's, you know, buttoned up. But I know that you come from a very different background than than what that represents to me, you know, all, traditionally all these years. Can you mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about uh, how you grew up and where you grew up? Yeah. And I just want to address real quickly, like what you just shared, because it happens. You're not the only one. OK, a lot of times they see uh, folks have told me um, they saw the name Dr. Ha and they thought it was a man. OK, when I get emails before we were putting pronouns in our bios, it was like, dear Mr. Ha, or, you know, some kind of male reference. So that's one thing that happens. And then, like you said, kind of button up, proper. And I'm not saying I'm improper. <laughs> but, you know, there's a, a yes, there's a history. There's a, these life stories, right, that kind of don't fit the, um, the narrative of like a, a general pathway for somebody who's um, a professor. So thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing that. It's, it's, it's a pretty common um, thing that happens to me. So I grew up in Texas and I know that, you know, you're from California, right? And, yes. and gr growing up in Texas, I remember meeting people from California and they would say, oh, there's Asian people in Texas. There are Vietnamese in Texas. I'm like, yeah, a lot actually. Right. <laughs> and um, so I grew up in Houston. Uh, I came to the U.S. in 1975 with my parents, April 30th, fall of Saigon. My dad was a pilot. So we were very, very fortunate to um, get out. Uh, I mean, fortunate relatively, right? To like boat folks and um, other folks who came later. Um, and uh, moved around the country a little bit. You know, dad was looking for a steady job and we landed in Houston in 1978. And that's where I started school. That's where we bought like, our first home, which my parents still have and still live in. And, um, you know, it's kind of like that working class neighborhood. Um, it's, it's the southeast part of town called South Belt. And that's pretty significant in, the, in a few stories down about that neighborhood. Uh, but it's a lot of Vietnamese uh, in that neighborhood. 
and um yeah and so i i always remember growing up was a strong presence of vietnamese people around me um in my school there were maybe not elementary because i started there and there were few vietnamese at the time but as i got older and then through middle school and high school a lot of vietnamese what, what did your your father end up and your mother end up uh working in what industry yeah, so uh, my dad, he kind of started with late day labor, you know, like a lot of folks. I remember he told me a story about uh, working for a watermelon farm wow. and, and he and his buddies, these other pilots, right, that all landed in San Antonio. Um, the widow who, who sponsored us also sponsored five other uh, Vietnamese uh, pilots. So she's like all of us in, and she found different families to host us. Um, but these, uh, he and his um, pilot buddies worked for a well watermelon farm and they would like, drop a watermelon once in a while right because if you drop it at bus you get to take it home right so that's how they got watermelon um but eventually we went to houston because my dad found a job as a machinist uh so he was um you know training uh, he took some classes and became machine a machinist my mom was a seamstress in vietnam and so she uh she fortunately found a job making like uh, sewing uh, uh, little baby t-shirts, you know, babies when they're born in the hospital, newborns, and they wear those little white t-shirts. She was uh, sewing those. And then an ophthalmologist in the hospital um, had um, started his own practice. And he asked the manager of that, that, that seamstress team to recommend him, uh, you know, one of her best, uh, you know, seamstress. And she was a Korean lady. And so she liked my mom, another Asian to another Asian. And she said, you should talk to that woman. And so he um, he asked her to sew, sew a sample for a ophthalmologic eye patch. So these eye patches that he designed for like cataract surgery, glaucoma. And I think it was like 1980 or something like that. And and he gave her the contract and she did that ever since. So, wow. yeah. So my parents were manufacturing uh, um uh, uh, hospital eye patches, um, orthopedic eye, uh, ophthalmologic eye patches since 1980. And did your father remain a machinist? So he, uh, I think it was like in the late 80s um, and early, uh, must have been late 80s, early 90s, there was an oil crisis in Houston and um, they were going to move him. So they were going to move him from the site, which was real close to our house all the way up into like a north side town, his commute would have been like an hour. And so he quit and he asked the doctor, the eye doctor, hey, can I make the other part of this eye patch? Cause it's two pieces. It's the metal eye shield, with the holes in it so you can see through it. And then it's the, the cloth that's around it. And so my mom would sew the cloth. And so my dad asked the uh, uh, ophthalmologist, can I make the metal piece? Cause I'm a machinist. So he's like, yeah, go ahead. So we invested in this big, pulley machine, this stamp machine. So my parents are, uh, they had the workshop in the garage. They converted the garage. And so they were always home um, working. That's a cool story. Yeah. It's um, hustling. The, the idea of just uh, putting one foot right in front of the other, figuring out that uh, opportunity. Yeah. You know? But they never were apart from each other, which is why they always fought every day. <laughs> It's like no break from each other. <laughs> but that made an opportunity for you all to be together constantly, though, right? Yeah. I, yes. It, you know, we were so privileged that we uh, we ate as a family every night. Right. My mom had the, the, the luxury of, of, of her own time to cook when she needed. Right. Um, I think at one point it was really, really busy for them. And so she hired like this woman to come in and like uh, watch us after school and cook for us. But we were a little brats because like my mom's cooking was really good. And this lady's cooking was like, <sighs> and so we told my mom, we're like, oh, do I know what? <laughs> like, I'm going on, well. And she's like, she tasted it. And I remember the woman made spaghetti and she freaking put sugar in it. I'm like, why would you put sugar in spaghetti? It was so sweet. And my mom tasted it. She's like, oh, this is bad. So she let her go and she said, like, okay, mom's going to cook for you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you did grow up and I'm going to ask these questions because it kind of paints a, a picture of your childhood, but um, where did it go? Um, I don't want to say wrong, but where did it go sideways about hanging out with uh, certain groups of people in that part of the world? Um, 
you know, it had, it had a lot to do with life outside of the home. Um, you hear a lot of stories of um, kids that join gangs, kids that uh, 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 get into like delinquency because their home life is broken. And I want to reiterate that was not the case in my, my situation. Right. Now, were my parents strict? Uh, absolutely. Did they like, did we, did when we fat, like, did we get punished? Absolutely. My dad had no problem going to the backyard, pulling that switch, you know, from the tree and like whacking us a few times. My mom had no hesitation, like, joy long guy, you know, like mm-hmm. smacking us around. So I'm not saying it was like, you know, peaceful. Um, but, uh, but, but they were home. Um, they provided us like financially, uh, I, we, we were fed. Right. Um, so, so I would, I would say the, the, the pull towards, um, uh, gang life was, um, because of life outside the home, the, the, the streets and the schools. And so you hear all the Asian Americans who've ever like talked about their early childhood who've had, who've been bullied. Right. And, and so, that was part of, of that, you know, I was, I, I was a girl, but I was not immune to being bullied. Um, but I was, I don't, I, I can't remember when it was, but I snapped. And so I like, I get into fights all the time. Um, I was not going to take it. Right. How old were you when that started to happen? Mm, like middle school, sixth grade, wow. 12, 13. 12 13 years old Mm -hmm. so were there a lot of vietnamese kids in your school or was that a racial thing Mm -hmm. or um it started off uh like uh the white girls picking on me but as i got older it was actually the vietnamese girls that were like picking on each other or there were some bullies among the vietnamese girls and um and they were picking on like the nice girls and uh, I was friends with a couple. I was trying to be friends with everybody. And I just, I don't know. I didn't like it. I, I, I think I've always like uh, tried to stand up for the, 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 the weak underdog or the people being picked on. So I would get into fights with these girls that um, uh, were the bullies. And then, you know, you, you, those girls were the ones I think that when I reflect now and I remember, I know them, right? I remember them. They were the ones with the bad life at home. They were the ones with the broken homes. And so hurt people hurt, you know? Yep. And so they were bullying the other girls. And um, and those that crowd then grew up to be like the hardcore gangster girls dating the gangster boys. And so, you know, I felt like, oh, okay. If I'm gonna, <laughs> if I, I don't know. I, I was drawn to that grittiness, right? Because um, uh, it just became... Uh, the way things were in school, uh, but in, keep in mind, I had good grades. I was on the volleyball team, so I was into sports. I remember my volleyball coach, like, seeing me hanging out after school with the, um, these, you know, these boys that would come after school, all black gear, you know, their dropped cars with the loud, like, we were playing, like, two live crew in the, in the parking lot, and she pulled me aside the next day. She's like, I don't want you hanging out with them. Like you have a good uh, future ahead of you. And uh, if you, if you continue, if I see you continuing to hang out with them, I'm going to, I'm going to cut you from the team. Right. Cause that's not like model behavior. So before she could cut me, I quit. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, fine. You know, like I was down for my, my, my friends. So. um, Okay. Let me, let me ask you this. I'm, I'm, Right now, listening to your story for the first time, I am imagining a a girl who comes from a very uh, stable family life. And I'm imagining just you sort of drifting in and out of these and, and being attracted to this, like sort of like this uh, grittier lifestyle. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have like siblings or brothers or sisters that were also part of that ecosystem that, that, that made you gravitate because I just can't imagine just like this girl who gets good grades comes from a decent loving family being attracted to that. I just feel like it's, there's more maybe cousins that are like in that space that draws you in as a clan and you all kind of partake in that activity or that lifestyle. Mm. Well, I'm the oldest in my family. So if there was an influence, I was the bad influence on my younger sisters who did date boys from the same gang that 
my boyfriend was in. So all three of us sisters were, uh, had boyfriends with the NCP crew, which is the North Chink Posse. And we were from the South side town, but I don't know, we, we got caught up with the, the, the boys from the North side of town. And, um, you know, to answer your question about like, well, what was the draw? What was the pull? Um, you know, I think that, I think that when you start, uh, uh, in the context of the bigger stuff that was going on, right? Like, um, at least for, uh, in high school, the, there were, there were, I would call them race wars, right? Like the Mexican boys would pick on the Vietnamese boys and the, the black kids, you know, the, the, there was there was definitely racial dynamics, right? Black kids were fighting Mexican kids, and the black kids were fighting the Asian kids. And I, I remember one time the um, there was this huge uh, fight in in the math hall. So the math hall was like the most crowded hall because everybody had to take math, and it was all these classes in this narrow hall. And it started in the math hall, and the next day somebody uh, said that uh, some Vietnamese kids were bringing guns to school. So the principal got on the um, auditorium speak or that I got on the speaker system and it was like all Asian boys report to the auditorium teachers please send all your Asian boys to the to auditorium so they sent all of the Vietnamese and they were mostly Vietnamese um in in the Asian American population in high school and they and they patted them down and they searched them and they went to to the lockers and um and nobody had a gun I mean we weren't bringing the guns into school I mean, we were packing them in the car wow. after school, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, so so I think that because of what was happening in that way, I, I um, drawn in. I, I got I was drawn in because I felt like it was unfair, and so I felt much more of an affinity, right, with like people or 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 friends who like were being oppressed, people who were being um, treated unfairly, uh, and 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 and. And I'm not going to lie. I mean, it was kind of fun too, you know? So I was doing my homework. Glamorous. Play, play volleyball until I quit the team. Um, but it was just more fun. Like, I'm just being so honest. Like, if you talk to the ex-gangsters, anybody who said like, oh, I don't know, you know, like they're lying because everybody knew we had a good time. So there's definitely that draw too, you know? And I don't know, I'm trying to unpack like the gender dynamics, what it is about women and like us being attracted to bad boys. Yeah. I, I'm not going to deny that at all. You know, I think there's still remnants of that today, right? Because <laughs> my mom be like, Why? do you want to meet this doctor? And I'm like, oh no, right? But I see some guy, he's all tatted up. I'm like, hmm, hmm. you know, like I'm freaking 48 years old. It's still there. Where, where the hell is that coming from? I'm still trying to figure that one out, kid. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a good topic okay L let me ask um from a um a sociological uh with your training when you look back on those high school um years and the dynamics that were going on could the government in theory or any government um knowing enough about sociology come in to kind of prevent those things from happening, those gangs and those, that sort of race war from happening at that level in high school? Well, I think the racial dynamics, you know, are, are, are a lot more complicated than the socioeconomic dynamics. And so let me start with the, 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 the easier ones, the socioeconomic. I mean, we see it repeated um, over time, like poverty, um, and, and, and discrimination, whether it's like through racism, right? Bullying at the individual level or structurally, right? The inability to get jobs, the inability to, the, you know, the economy at the time, right? When, when um, in the seventies and the eighties, you know, there were some struggles in the US economy and even in the South and Texas. And so people were hard pressed for jobs yeah. um, and, and, and to, to make a living. So we as refugees come in and uh, you know, where do we where do we get to live? We get to live in the, the poorest of neighborhoods. And there are so many incredible stories of people who've risen from that. Like we have uh, more than enough stories, more than our fair share of success, like rising out of that, right? And so I would do not want to discount that. But not everybody can be the same, right? And 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 it's true, like we make decisions that like get us to certain uh, places in our lives. Um, but 
but the, but the, 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 the likelihood that um, delinquency happens is much more than if your um, uh, family life and your home life and your, your, your uh, uh, income and your jobs and your finances were taken care of, right? Or at least buffered. And so, um, but, but I think that, the, so there's one thing, right? The, the, the socioeconomic distress that, that yeah. refugees live in. Then the other thing is like parent life. Right. So I just talked about like how how solid my parents were not to each other. They were fighting all the time. So yeah. that's another story. Right. But um, but but there were parents that were um, uh, absolutely traumatized, probably very emotionally broken. Right. Mental health illness, yeah. alcoholism. Uh, you know, some of my friends, they would tell me stories about like just getting the shit beat out of them. Physical right. Abuse. Yeah. Like major physical abuse emotional abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. Um, and so that, that compounded within like, you go to school, you're not doing well, you don't know the language. Um, English is difficult to learn. Uh, ESL was not a thing in the, or a, a widespread thing in the seventies and the eighties. Um, and, and certainly not for Vietnamese language, right? Yeah. So uh, you've got a language barrier, you're not doing well in school. And then the kids pick on you, right? The, 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 the terms they say, use, you know, the eyes, the, like the physical, like they will punch you, they will kick you, they will spit on you, they'll push you around, right? Um, so, so in those circumstances, um, what can governments do? What can institutions do? I mean, I'm, I'm a pessimist when I think about like the sociocultural fabric of the United States. Right. As a culture, there's many great things. And yet, like discrimination, harm, right, bullying. Um, uh, uh, but that's very and, and I think we're trying to do something better nowadays. Yeah. Right? But back then, um, I just felt like it was, there wasn't that much. Yeah. I mean, there's no back in those days in that part of the country, there's no awareness on how to kind of like approach it in a, and attack this it's it's looking in hindsight you can kind of like figure out the pieces that are making all of this stuff happen but when you're in it during those years the 80s and the 90s it was a bunch it was a lot of chaos that uh you know of course that was going to happen especially in these poor you know uh distressed uh, neighborhoods yeah and there were other gangs around right gangs that were created by other socioeconomic systems, black gangs, Mexican gangs, white gangs, white supremacy gangs. I mean, there was a lot of white supremacy and I'm not saying that it's, I don't know if it's gotten better in Texas, you know? Oh, really? But um, so, uh, so now you've got these other gangs and so you form your own gangs mm -hmm. for sources of protection, right? Or like, and like brotherhood, if your family's broken. Uh, um, uh, so, so many uh, com so many factors can contribute and one single way doesn't uh, explain like the whole uh, general uh, experience of, of uh, what say we're like Vietnamese gang life you you, you have elements like if you talk to a, a lot of the folks that um, were in it at the time you know there are similar stories but there are so many uh, variables that had impacted us um, socially structurally institutionally and then um, day by day, like living daily life, um, being, um, you know, being treated poorly. You know, there's a another guest I had on, uh, Dr. Kimberly K. Huang, and um, I'm not, you probably mm -hmm. share the same space, but she grew up in a pool hall with, uh, you know, very loving family. And, but, you know, she brought up a really interesting point. A lot of the young boys that were, and I had a lot of cousins that were like in this situation where, their mom and dad were stuck in Vietnam, but they went with an mm -hmm. uncle or, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many of that where the parents are like, well, I'll send my first two born sons mm -hmm. because they can go with their uncles and, you know, survive out there in the ocean. And they become yeah. somebody in the US hopefully and bring the rest of the family back. But many times a lot of those guys got caught up in gangs and their, their uncles and aunts that brought them over, didn't treat them right and, you know, <laughs> Their, their lives just went astray. And Kimberly um, talks a lot about the, that sort of, um, you know, during the holidays where they had nowhere to go, they would come to her mom and dad's pool hall. And you yeah. realize there's like this huge chunk of young men at that time who were <clears throat> rudderless. They didn't know where they were headed. 
Yes, yes. My uncle was <clears throat> one of those. So my dad sponsored a bunch of his brothers and the youngest uncle, would, um, you know, at the time, I think they did not have that kind of guidance, you know, and everybody's trying to uh, figure their own um, thing. My parents are trying to raise us. So my uncle was 13, I think, at the time that he came, 12, 13, um, parentless, living with us, but it was a crowded home, you know, and he's 13. So his English was really, really poor. Throw him in school, no guidance. Um, and so he ended up leaving the house and he joined a different gang. Um, oh, man. Yeah. So so I've got my uncle, you know, got some friends uh th that all got into um uh that lifestyle and i think what um dr huang was saying kimberly k is that uh there are um th these are all the traumas that came from from war right and and being uh being refugees and kind of the um uh the uh, mass uh massive uh it, it, you know migration um story that that then like that if you can predict it like we're like thinking that the the refugee crisis now um with our you yes. know um folks in afghanistan and the history of syrian refugees and other refugees and other immigrant groups um you know that's how you see history being repeated and i don't think that they're going to be able to avoid any of this stuff because the irish gangs or the you know the gangs that came from europe uh in the early part of um america's founding or throughout the last hundred years they probably gone through the same discrimination or mm -hmm. they had to band together to protect themselves from you know maybe like a different type of uh, american that would encroach on their space and yeah yeah indeed Indeed, yeah. thinking like a historian and sociologist, Ken. <laughs> well, bring up this really interesting thing that happened. So you and I are like sort of like growing up in the same time frame. Um, I had per peripheral sort of contact with the gangs, just like you. I, you probably lived a, a much deeper into that lifestyle. I was on the peripheral. I thought it was cool, but being from los angeles and koreatown i didn't really grow up around a lot of vietnamese daily like the my friends in orange county the vietnamese uh, guys that i went to high school with but it was happening a lot in the um 80s and 90s and then something happened in the mid 90s where it was like a light switch over i think it was about a year all of the gangs started to it, it just kind of like dissipated and went away. <clears throat> and I wonder if anybody has ever talked about or wrote about the introduction of ecstasy at the time. Because Ooh. I felt like when ecstasy arrived, um, it was like at the height of like the rave scene um, mm. being, being birthed at that time. And we were all beginning to go to raves and we were beginning to sort of like, you would see like rival gangs meeting at raves and like it was like a big love fest <laughs> i don't so i don't know what what it was like in houston or where you grew up but out here in california probably in around 97 98 is when things started to really shift and you know the acceptance of 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 rival gangs being in one place hugging it out was mind-blowing <laughs> uh you know i I was, I have never, I never did drugs. So when I was younger, I didn't touch the weed. I didn't touch the coke, the crack, the, the ecstasy, nothing. I was like, I need to live clean. And I think it was because I was, I was into sports. So even though I dropped out of the volleyball team, I was playing in other leagues. And so, uh, but yes, I do remember a lot of folks, a lot of Vietnamese um, uh, uh, dropping, rolling, you know, yeah. the ecstasy, going to raves. I have never thought about that, Ken. So I, I, I like that angle. I'm thinking of the um, the conditions that 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 really um, busted up the gangs. So in the '80s was when you saw the like the the, the heightened violence, right? The home invasions, uh, the Vietnamese like gangs, and even becoming organized gangs. So like by the late '80s, early '90s, we're not just talking about like a couple of street you know, uh, 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 kids like, you know, robbing some houses and 
we're talking about extortion, money laundering, um, um, murder, uh, uh, large trafficking rings, uh, prostitution, right? So, and, and then that violence was the, the rivalry with like other gangs. And so I know in LA and in, in New York, um, there were Chinese gangs now that that were like, hey, you know, these Vietnamese gangs, they're starting to extort the same businesses we're extorting. Yeah. Like and so there was turf and territory. And so the violence ensued and 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 that's when law enforcement was like, okay, this is now not just a one-off. This is on our radar. I know that in Houston, the um, uh, Houston Police Department formed an um, Asian gang task force. And, um, and I would say in the early 90s and through the mid 90s, that's when they right. really start to do their sweep, right? And and if you look at the history of some of the LA Vietnamese gangs, the New York Vietnamese gang, uh, Born to Kill, right? David Tai, there's a book on him, uh, notorious like Vietnamese gang up there. Uh, that's when they were. That's when they were broken up, right? In the 90s. So you you got that factor, and then you know, and a lot of guys went to prison in the 90s, 80s, 90s. Um, and, and, and long-term sentences. So they're not doing like, you know, five, 10 years, they're doing 30, 40, 50 life sentences. Um, the first Asian American put on death row, um, post moratorium. So there was a moratorium, uh, because the, the, the Supreme court said that the death penalty was being, um, imposed, uh, disproportionately against minorities. And so they had states uh, redo their policies and practices to ensure more fairness, right? And so um, Texas uh, re-entered that um, era, um, and, and um, I think it was in 1975, I believe. But uh, post that, uh, um, it was a Vietnamese man who was um, executed in Texas for a pool hall shooting, right? And so we're talking, you know, like incarceration, death, drug overdose, right? And um, I think the ecstasy, you know, there may be something to your your theory. I, I, I have no idea, but I but I have heard it makes you very friendly. <laughs> and so I could imagine, you know, now, yeah, we, now we, were, like, we were promoting parties to, at that time. What's that? I was promoting parties uh, at were, that time for two years. So you like, witnessed it. 95, it just went away. It's the weirdest thing. Mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry. I, what were you going to say? Oh, you know, it, but ecstasy also brought in um, I, I would say like some of the gangsters got smarter. They're like seeing their homies go in, you know, for these street crimes. And they're like, you know what? We got to figure out a different way of doing things. And so ecstasy as a, as a, as a, uh, as a, a drug was like, uh, uh, you know, something that a lot of people went towards um, dealing. And I have two friends, they're brothers um, and they just came home from federal prison. Was it two years ago? for um, operating one of the largest um, ecstasy rings um, in, in the Southern district of like, of the federal district. So they were doing it out of this, um, they were money laundering through this club that everybody in Houston was going to at the time. And like, I was going there, but at the time I didn't know that they were like running this huge drug ring, right? Um, so. So they got locked up from then and just got out right now? Yeah. Can you imagine? all the Vietnamese guys that were locked up in the 90s, late 90s and were and are they're still there Were and are mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. sad think I had a high school friend who got in for attempted or he, I think he did murder somebody. And I remember mm -hmm. he got, you know, 25 years or something. Mm -hmm. Thousands of Vietnamese men at that time who have a a dear connection to that um, segment of history and to somebody who is was very special to you. Um, can we get into that? Sure, sure. It's his birthday today, by the way. Happy birthday to... Happy birthday to Vu. To Vu. Mm -hmm. So how did you meet him? Uh, who is he and what's his significance in your life? Uh, well, uh, who is he? He was, um, uh, uh, you know, Vietnamese refugee, just like um, us. He came to the U.S. when he was six. Um, he was, his family came by boat. Um, he grew up in Houston with me. Uh, he was part of um, NCP. And 
Uh, so I met him. <laughs> I met him through my ex, actually. <laughs> he broke. He broke bro code because he was part of the gang, and then my ex was um, one of the leads of the gang. Uh, this guy named LT, and um, after we broke up, LT and I broke up. Um, you know, I tried to go. St I, t I did, Ken. I tried to go Great. straight. Okay, I was in. I started college, and I and I was like, you know what? I'm not. Gonna, I gotta. I'm gonna go get date college boy. And LT would like send his dudes to like uh, threaten these guys. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember this one guy I really liked. He was tall. He was handsome. He's Vietnamese. He was in college, and he played volleyball. And he just stopped talking to me one day. And I was like, what happened? What did I do? And he would not talk to me. And it was not till years later that I found out LT and his crew like was like, you need to stay away from her. If I see her around you, we're going to come get you. And then I think his home was robbed like a few weeks later. So he freaked out. And he's like, yeah, I'm not talking to her. <laughs> well, how long so, were you at LT for? Uh, like two years. I was like 16 to 18 right and then um but then I met Vu uh because my sister was dating a guy named Tuan Tung who uh, was part of NCP and we went out that night to a karaoke bar and and, and Vu was there and so uh it was like it was like love at first sight like he was so cute but he he was he had this uh this gangster swag but he was like real sweet real timid kind of shy you know like it didn't match right yeah like, what's up with this dude like and um he was not aggressive he didn't like i mean he was just different um so eventually you know we started talking and um and lt like again tried to threaten him and uh he he stood up for me he's like all right what are we gonna do we gonna fight about this okay <laughs> Right. So LT was like, all right, you know what? Let it go. And um, and that's how uh Vu and I ended up uh together. How close was LT and Vu? They were close. They were homies. We really crossed that bro code. He did, he did, he did. Um uh, did, did they exist in the same space after you and Vu got together? No, you know, I I, one of the other things that was, um, the reason why I left LT is because I tried to get him to go straight. I was like, you can't do this gang life forever. You can't be doing that. You know, maybe you should go back to school, you know, or at least get a job. I can't introduce you to my parents like, like this, you know? Yes. And, um, he didn't, he kind of like got further and further into gang life. So I, I, you know, that was one of the reasons that uh, didn't work out for us. I told you, Ken, I really tried. Okay. I was trying to stay straight or go straight and leave this life behind. Um, but my, I met Vu and, and he was willing, right? He was like, you know what? I'm gonna try for you. Um, I dropped out of high school, ninth grade, but I can get a job, you know? And, um, and, and so he kind of took himself away from a, a, a lot of those elements when we were together. And then what happens? I mean, he, he, he obviously didn't leave the life, right? Right. Right. Um, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's a process, right? So you, 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 maybe you don't, you're not fully out of it, but you, at least you've, you've, you've tapered it down. Um, but the thing about Vu and the thing that one of the things that I loved about him so much was he, you know, he wore his heart on his sleeve. He had this really big heart. So anybody who needed help, he was going to help. And, and, you know, they, they would call him and, you know, if there was a situation, he would go. Um, so he wasn't in it in the daily, right? But some kind of like mess would come up, and then he would he would he would show up, right? And um, you know, and we were young, and um, you know, I, I we didn't know how to manage like love and pain and like jealousy and 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 uh, those kinds of things when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, right? So. Um, we never fought, but uh, we didn't know how to have conversations. So it was more like avoidance, right, of like issues. And, um, and then eventually he um, got caught in a situation uh, in a, a, a club shooting, or it was a shooting that resulted from a fight in a club. And, um, and, and he, uh, the person that was shot was not, uh, he didn't die, but he was severely injured. 
And, um, you know, this is in the 90s, again, mid 90s. So there were also sentencing reform that was happening at the federal and state level, like harsher, harsher sentences um, that were being handed down as a result of uh, the other, the, the war on drugs, right? And the other um, violence that was happening in other communities of color, uh, black communities, um, uh, uh, you know, Mexican communities, Latino communities. So, uh, so he got 60 years uh, for aggravated assault with a de deadly weapon. Did he have right? a prior history? He had one prior, one prior that was a, a, a burglary. Wow, 60 yeah. years. Like, mm -hmm. And how old was he when he got that handed down? 24. Yeah. 24. And, um, you know, his friend, you know, there's a difference between um, what happened in the streets and what happens like in the courts, right? Yeah. So when I um, teach um, introduction to justice studies, I talk about like, uh, I talk about factual guilt, right? In, in a court of law and technical guilt, right? So you can be factually guilty, like you did it, but if you have the right circumstances and maybe the right lawyers, you know, and the right resources, you could be found technically not guilty through due process, right? The many ways that our court systems work. You could also be uh, factually not guilty, mm. but through a series of things in the courts, you could be found technically guilty. And we've seen that happen because the Innocence Project has shown us like plenty of people who've been um, put away for crimes they didn't commit. And in Boo's case, you know, um, he was there at the shooting, you know, um, but 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 we all know he knows. I know his buddy that was with him knows. Everybody in in the crew, everybody in Houston knows he didn't. He wasn't the trigger guy, right? He didn't pull the trigger. It was his buddy, and and through a series of events, and I don't want to you know get into the details of the court cases, but um, he would not testify against his friend. That's that's bro code, right? So he's like, I'm not going to say anything. Um, and, and he took that silence and it meant that he would do the time and his, um, you know, uh, his friend had the better lawyer and, and, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of negotiation between the two of them too. So there were, you know, his family, Lou's family thinks like, did, did G, the guy who, who did it, um, did he manipulate Boo into thinking like, yeah, I'm, you know, you do this, I'm gonna do this and we're both gonna get out of it, right? And, um, and that didn't dilemma. happen. What's that? The prisoner's dilemma. There's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, and I've asked him about it many times. We had talked about it. You know, I was like, how do you feel about that? You know, like you stood up for something that you believed in, but that cost you like your life, 60 years in prison. And he said at first he thought, you know, like, that's what you do right? Like he was like, oh, it's fine. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to appeal my case and like, I'm going to get, you know, my family's going to get lawyers and um, I'm going to beat this. Right. So it was like some arrogance at the beginning. Then when he realized that that wasn't happening, um, it was too late. Right. And, the, and like, again, um, bro code, like, I'm not going to do that to him. Um, he's got like a wife and kid. Um, you know, if, it's almost like his sacrifices. Like I'm not married. I ain't got kids, so I'm. You know, I can do this time for him. You know, um, and and that's a real thing. People people really believe that that they'll do time for their brothers. So, so um, did he get out of this whole scenario? No. Oh, G didn't escape the the court system. Who G? Yeah, he did a little bit of time. Um, but he did not get 60 years because so, he came out pretty early. So can we talk about this a little bit? Was he the trigger mm -hmm. man? Mm -hmm. The trigger man, um, mm -hmm. but got out a lot earlier. Okay, so let me, can I ask you this? Being so close to that world, right? When you think about the implications of this bro code and where men have to take that sort of burden for their brother on a on a on a street level if you were still in that situation and you could go back in time 
would you advise Vu differently, knowing you know the world of the gangsters, you know the code, and you understand the, the judicial code, and you understand how this all plays out? If you could go back in time, I know it's a kind of an unfair question, but if you could go back in time, would you advise Vu to rethink? And how would you, I mean, if you would, I don't know if you would or not, but. I tried then. <laughs> I was like, do not take the fall for this fool. Okay. And, and I know his family, you know, his sisters, everybody, everybody Bad was man. like, don't do it. Um, but you know, um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of love between um, uh, these 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 men that are that are in it together, um, and so and and in many ways prison time is also uh, not seen as I don't know as terrifying as horrifying as like we would think of prison, you know it's like he'd been to jail before already so you know what's what's the big deal i'll just do some time right um and in many ways uh for some it's like a badge of honor right and the idea is like you get out you get out and then now you have like you not only have street cred you got time cred right you did time and and there's like a a, a status to that so we could think of it one way and and rationalize that decision and yet in a different world, in a different culture, in a different way of being, uh, which is gang life, um, there's um, uh, the, the way he saw the world was very different, which informed his decision. So knowing what you know now and going back in time, there, you don't think that there's any way to convince somebody going into that situation to rat his friend out? The only, well, one of the ways that I think might have been effective, because I see it being effective now, um, is um, bringing someone in who's done the time, you know, and 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 someone that that they can relate to, someone that Vu would have related to, right? Um, uh, we didn't have that gift of like another Vietnamese man who'd done like 20, 30 years going back to Vu and saying, hey man, I know how you're feeling. I know what you're going through. I went through it too. I made the same decision as you. You don't want to be in prison. Here's what happens when you go in, you know, like your friends will forget about you, right? Don't, people are going to stop writing you who's nobody's going to visit you. Like you will be alone. And then in prison, there's a whole prison life, prison politi politics, prison gangs. Like you want to get caught up in that, you know? So I, and that's what we do. That's what I see happening today in our mentoring spaces uh, that we have for um, young people who are, who are in the juvenile system. We don't want to send them somebody who doesn't, mm -hmm. it hasn't experienced what they've experienced because they're going to look at them and like, what, what do you know? You don't get it, right? So in hindsight, going back, if there was one thing that I thought might have been effective, it might have been that. So this was over 20 years ago, right? This was in 1997. So yeah, almost 25 years ago. Wow. And what made you decide to stick by somebody like this? I mean, it sounds like you stayed very involved in Vu's life. I actually didn't for a while. Um, so we have this parallel thing uh, that I think about. So his case was in December of 96. That's when the case happened. And then he went away in um, later that year in 97, like late 97 was when he had his conviction. 97 was also a significant year for me. Um, again, I was living two worlds, right? Yeah. And um, Vu and I didn't, you know, we, we had broken up for a little bit. We wanted to get back together, but it was always like different timing. And, and um, I was had a boyfriend, he had a girlfriend, whatever, but, but we would always keep in touch. And I knew that there was always a love there. But again, like I said, we didn't know how to communicate that. Right. How, how long were you guys going out together before this, before he went away? We met in 92. So we had known each other five years already. 
And then um, how long were you dating and boyfriend and girlfriend? Uh, like in the beginning, we were together almost a year. Then we had a breakup. Then we would get back and we'd talk. And then, you know, and then it was like, so it was only a really like a, a year of solid like togetherness and everything else was kind of in and out patchwork, patchwork since yeah. then, right? Um, and, um, and so in 97, he went away, um, in 95, 96, a few years before that, uh, uh, one of our close brothers, Tuan, the one I mentioned, my, my sister's boyfriend, he went away. Um, I had another friend pass away. Um, so I just started to see everybody like not in a good ending. Like they, they were, got, they got incarcerated. They, um, suicide right other people were getting shot um my uncle was gone like we didn't know what happened to him uh I remember the police the Houston police came to raid our home right it was like terrifying they were like throwing stuff everywhere and like they came and busted into my room and under my bed through my closets right like you know it was it was a um it was a scary time and and then and then you know I mean it's hard to say this, but uh, then I got shot, right? And so I, in 97, I got um, in the crossfire of a, of a gang shooting. So, so that will, uh, that will awake, you know, that'll do something to you. Okay, I'm not gonna let that go. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to unpack that. Where were you when that happened? At a pool hall. <laughs> What what was the circumstance? <laughs> what, was it, um, were Red you Paul, involved? I was not involved in that particular incident. Um, I would so I would be a I was in the crossfire, um, but I knew the parties that were involved, and um, you know it was it was it was such a typical scene. And I've been to parties, I've been to karaoke bars, clubs, other pool halls where shootings yeah. would happen, right? And I would always feel like, whew, dodge that bullet. Yeah. And then this time I didn't. And, um, but I remember after, uh, after the incident, when um, we were, you know, figuring out like who did it and who were, who were, who were they shooting at and who was, what was going on. Um, uh, then I had to find myself in a court case. Cause then like, are you going to testify? Right. Um, against the shooter and uh, that was a difficult thing because uh, you know they threatened me right they, they told me not to take the stand bad things were going to happen um, people who knew who did it wouldn't come forward as a witness I remember this one guy he was like supposedly in love with me back then you know and then I was like, you know who did it are you going to go you are you going to go do the lineup right he's like no man I can't like I'm like, bitch, you're not going to do this for me? Supposedly you love me, right? But he was scared, right? And I was like, you chicken shit. So, um, so I have a girlfriend that did it, right? She was brave enough. But, but, but we both got like death threats and, you know, like threats of violence. And, and I was just like, you know what? I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired because my brother wanted to retaliate. My uncle wanted to retaliate. NCP wanted to retaliate. Everybody wanted to retaliate for what happened, right? And I was just like, no, I'm so tired of it. You know, um, Lou was gone, Tuan was gone. You know, it was just, it was just, it was just too much. And then like the way that my parents, you know, how it hurt them. Um, reflecting on like I could have, I could have not made it because it was a hollow point bullet. Right. And so I'm very fortunate that it hit me in the arm and not somewhere else because hollow points like, you know, explode. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, man, so I was just like, okay, mm, gotta, I gotta rethink everything. And, <laughs> and that's when I said, I'm sorry, Vu, like part of my journey to like turn my life around. I want to support you, but like, I, you know, and then he wrote me a letter was like, I want you to move on. I don't want, you know, like, I'm sorry, I hurt you. 
to think about that letter, you know, it was like the goodbye letter. It was, it was hard, but I think that if I hadn't gotten shot, I might've still tried to um, stick with him and be like, okay, you know, you're going to appeal the case, you know, maybe you'll be out in like five years, seven years, I don't know, whatever. But um, I just had to take care of my, myself. And um, so. Did, did you testify against the, the shooter in, in your case? I was ready and the DA had me like primed and ready. And the day before the case, he pled out, he pled guilty, pled guilty to a lesser charge. And then, um, uh, and then he was up for parole. And I remember writing a letter to the parole board, you know, about how it impacted me and that he shouldn't be out, but he was released. Um, I think after like seven years, it was his first crime and nobody died, you know, I guess. Um, and, um, but then he eventually, um, uh, went back in, he murdered his girlfriend. He, um, was very, a very jealous person, I guess. Um, and he, um, he went to his girlfriend's house and, uh, strangled her, burned the house. And, um, and, and, and so he's, he's in for life now. Yeah. Horrific. Yeah. That's some shit, man. <laughs> yeah, that is some real shit. That's some real shit. Yeah. And I had PTSD then, and I didn't know it because we didn't know it. I never heard of PTSD. I think maybe I remember it was for veterans. But I had nightmares every night. Like every few nights, I would have these nightmares of this guy like chasing me. He would chase me in a movie theater. He would chase me in like a ballroom. And like, you know, uh, it was just I would wake up like with like, like just full of sweat and, um, and uh, be worried. And then another, I remember another dream where he shot a, a, a boyfriend that I was with, right? So I was having these like nightmares. And then um, I would go anywhere I would go and I would hear like, um, like a, a, a muffler pop or like a, a garbage, you know, like those large garbage mm -hmm. tops, like pop, you know, like any kind of loud boom. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was a crazy time. So, okay. So you get shot and you, you leave the life. Like you finally, um, are yeah. now you're done. You're, you're over yeah. this, right? Okay. So I, then... I, I had dropped out of college at the time. Okay. I went to college. I'd always wanted to be a writer. Um, and I wanted to study, get a degree in English. Right. And my mom and dad were like, you already speak English. Why would you study English? You, you know, that makes no sense. You, you, typical, like you gotta be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, a nurse, whatever. And, and I, and I did it because of guilt, because I had done all these other things in, in my life. I guess I went to jail for shoplifting. It was only one night, you know, I got probation, but um, I was stealing for my crew. Right. And, and so I, I had a lot of guilt um, about like the, the bad things I was doing. So I said, okay, you know what? To please my parents, I'm gonna go study, be a doctor. And I hated biology. I remember getting an 18 out of 100 on my first organic chemistry test. And I was like, I'm dumb. I'm not smart. I can't, I can't do college, right? So I tried and I changed my major like five times. And I was just like, okay, maybe this is just not for me. And um, yeah, so. So, so you, I dropped out of college, my friends were all screwed up, and then I got shot, and it broke my parents' heart, and I watched them, like, look at me in the hospital room It was just love, you know, like, I was like, oh, they're gonna fucking kill me, I'm gonna kill, they're gonna kill me for getting shot in the middle of the night, and having them wake up at 3 a.m. to come get me in the hospital, right, but it was so not like that, they were, they were like, it's gonna be okay, you know, we're gonna take care of you, I mean, my mom would like stroke my hair, you know, and I was just like, Fuck, what the hell am I doing? Right. Um, yeah. They came at me with love. And so I was like, okay. And and they weren't I, like that, like at all before that happened. Like they weren't loving. Like no, I, I mean, I mean, they were, but not in a, um, not in a crisis sense, because I guess I've never gone through crisis, you know, like, I, I remember, you know, they would come out with tough love, just like a lot of other Vietnamese parents, like, they don't say I love you, they don't, you know, hug you, they don't kiss you, and I'm not saying, it might, and I think that, like, in crisis is when 
they were like, oh my God, my daughter's, look at her. She's laying in the hospital with like a, a hole in her arm and blood everywhere. And like, um, she could have she got right. Like, yeah. And, and, and so, um, it, it, it took, it, it brought something out of them that I'd not seen before. And, and it's not that they weren't, uh, it's not that they were abusive. They just weren't, um, loving. And I really thought they were going to like, rip me a new one (laughs) for being out late and getting you know um getting myself about that you think about that on a cultural level how most parents most of our vietnamese uh parents of that generation have no idea most most of them i would say have no idea how to emotionally connect during the time that we were growing up and i this is just one example um that they did the right thing because it could have easily been like, how annoying am I, you know, mm-hmm. all of this sort of finger pointing, but it didn't work out that way. It They yeah. approached it with love. But if you think about like all of the other times that we grew up as a uh, second generation group of, or one and a half of, of these kids, if they approached everything with love first, then we, you know, the whole group of, young kids at that time would have probably turned out a lot different. They yeah. don't need to say, I love yeah. you. I mean, they just need to, well, they do, they kind of do in America, right? <laughs> kind of have to let the kids know that it's a very communicative uh, society. And, but Vietnamese parents of that generation didn't approach it that way. Mm-hmm. Got in trouble for yeah, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you another story. Um, when I, one of my, one of our friends, he was wanted and he was well. He was wanted for for um, a home robbery, gone wrong, um, and the homeowner was um, um, injured. And you know, his parents were like the typical, like difficult, but also like not around. Um, and I remember, I remember he went on the run, and his dad and mom, who like were never really involved in his life I thought they were going to be like hey you need to turn yourself in hey you need to do the right thing you know and then that they were like oh my god I don't want this to happen to my son and they're like maybe we can get you to Vietnam maybe we like they were going to hide him you know and I was like oh man but in the end he his own decision to turn himself in was because if I go on the run in the way that his parents had shown him love in that that crisis moment, right? He was like, oh man, my parents don't want to turn me in. My parents want to help me run, want to hide me, right? Like send money to Vietnam or whatever. And so um, he turned himself in because he said, if I run, I'll never get, I'll never see them again. And if I go, if I, if I face up to my crime and I do the time, maybe one day, or, you know, maybe they can visit, still visit me and one day I'll be out. But if I go the other route, I'll never see them again. And then what happened to that person? So he did, he, he, he went in, um, he did his time and um, he got um, 50 years. Five zero. Five zero. Um, and he got out in 2019. So he did 26 years, but he's home with his parents now. Do you keep in touch with him? Mm-hmm. And, it's my bro, my little bro. <laughs> God almighty. And what is he what has he done since he's gotten out? Um he um he went to school while he was inside. He got a couple of degrees, associate's degrees. Um he he got out, he got a job, he's working. Um he's hoping, you know, get a girlfriend, maybe get married, have a family. He just wants a normal life now, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. And you know, real funny story. So um, he was at one unit and, and Vu and him know each other, they're friends. And he was at one unit and Vu was at a different unit. And um, after a while, uh, Tuan, his name is Tuan, his, his parents got a little older and he um, uh, applied for a, a, a hardship transfer. So you can transfer to another unit so that your parents don't have to travel so far to see you. And he ended up at Vu's unit. So they got a few years together, right? Mm-hmm. And Tuan was like, 
this unit is a hellhole. Like, you need to get out of here, boo. You don't know what, like, this is the worst unit that I've ever seen. And, um, and he tried to convince him, like, to do a transfer and stuff like that. But, you know, boo was like, ah, uh, you know, I've, I've built myself a life here in prison, right? You got your friends, you got your status, you know, the way things work. Like, you, he didn't want to change, even though he knew, like, there were other units that had better programs, air conditioning. This one didn't have air conditioning, right? So, um, so Tuan was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> okay, I'm not, I don't want to leave you, bro, but I'm out. So he transferred to a different unit. And the, when Tuan was um, approved for parole, he had to transfer, he, he was processed out of his unit um, at Vu's unit. And so this was in 2019. And he told me, Tuan told me, he's like, yeah, I, I tried to find him. You know, I tried to say goodbye, and and I was the one who had relayed the information to Vu that Tuan had got parole, so we were all happy and stuff. But he sent him a little note, right? So these, these little kites, right? Sent him a note so over there, this guy, this guy, and so he, you know, he was like, it was the best feeling in the world because he was getting out of prison. He's like, but it was also a like a bittersweet thing because he really wanted to see Vu, right? Um, just in that moment where he was transferring out, and he didn't get the chance to see that. So, uh, you know, those little stories that are, are the ones that I kind of like uh, think about when, when we're talking about like friendship and love and like um, the lives of these men after, you know, doing so much time. When did you re-enter uh, back into Vu's life? Because um, you're now going on a different path. You're a little bit more straight and narrow. But I'm sure you Oh, didn't yes. Know. I went the other way. I was like, I want to have nothing to do with y'all. I don't want to talk about it. I never told anybody what happened to me. I um, I said, I'm gonna go back to school. I'm gonna become a lawyer because um, I wanna help others. You know, I saw Vu's case, like he got screwed over and I wanted to be an advisor. So I went back and I studied sociology and I remember my, my one of my professors, um, she was the first professor that I ever remember talking about Vietnamese people in class. So I'd taken all these history classes, psychology classes, sociology classes. And she's this Latina, and it was sociology of the family, and she talked about Vietnamese families. It's like, whoa, somebody's talking about us, right? And she had us read these articles about Vietnamese families. And I was like, mind blown. I'm like, whoa, we could, there's people writing about our experience. And so I came to her and I was like, hey, you know, um, it, you know, is there anything, anything volunteer that I can do? I'm trying to get into law school. I want to like maybe be your intern or whatever. And she like, literally, she's like, you want to go to law school? You know, she's like, um, you want to have a life someday? <laughs> you know, like, you know how lawyers work 80 hours a week, you know, to be successful? She's like, what kind of lawyer do you want to be? And I said, defendant, defender, you know, defense lawyer, criminal defense. She goes, oh, you want to be broke too? <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I'm like, okay, never mind. And um, yeah, so... She said, you should be a sociologist. You're a natural. I've seen your grades, I've seen your essays. You are going to go to graduate school and become a PhD like me. I was like, wow. Okay. She guided me. And that's how I ended up um, going that path. Wow. So you just kind of listened to her. Okay. So then you take this path, but then at some point it brings you back to reaching out back to VU. Yes. Because in, um, so I finished my degrees. I got my job in Oceanside, California. So I moved away from Texas, which was a great relief because it was like, I'm gonna start over. You know, after I moved out of Houston, I went to Austin for graduate school and I just was like, I'm gonna create a new self. It's gonna be different. And then I got a chance to be, um, to go on sabbatical in um, 2018. And my, um, I, I had by then read a lot of works by um, Asian Americans, Vietnamese Americans. And again, I love writing and, and reading. And so I became friends with the author of I Love User for White People, Black Sue. And so he became like a really good friend. And he's like, Tao, you got to write your story. You know, like, you got a crazy story. I'm like, yeah, I don't know. You know, kind of imposter syndrome. And like, my dad always like, you just need to stay humble. You don't, don't think you're all that. Right? So I remember that all the time in my head. I'm like, hey, I'm not all that. And I know I've done these things, but just stay humble. And, uh, and I was like, I don't know, like, I don't know if anybody wants to hear my story. It's not that big of a deal. He's like, no, it's, you know, so he convinced me. So I started writing. 
about that life, right? About like growing up as a refugee in Texas, what it meant to be like part of like gang life and like how I ended up where I am. And, and in that process, when I started writing about Vu, I started crying, Ken. I was like, because you have to get into the moment and you have to put down the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the, the memories, right? Oh, it was, I started crying so bad, right? And I was like, and, and, and all of these years, you were not in contact with Vu. He um, would send me like Christmas cards occasionally. I remember he tried to call on like a hot cell phone, um, maybe like in 2013, 2014, something like that. And I got scared and I'd like, didn't want to pick up the phone. And that was that time when he was in with Tuan. So Tuan had called. I picked up the phone. Tuan's like, hey, sis. I'm like, oh, hey, Tuan. He's like, hey, somebody wants to say hi to you. I was like, who is it? And in Vu's voice. And he has a very distinct, raspy voice. So I heard it and I was like, oh, hey. Um, hey, you know what, guys? I'm real busy. Like, uh, hey, Tuan, like, call me back another time, okay? Uh, it's good, good, good talking to you, Vu. All right, gotta go, guys. And I hung up and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, right? It was just too, emo it was too over overwhelming for me and then they would call back and i never picked up again 2018 like, this was no to like 2013 2014 okay. it was still yeah. fresh for you um unprocessed i mean yeah, oh yeah oh yeah i was like oh, i don't want to talk to him yeah i don't want to talk to him i don't know what that's like right and then i remember his sister he must have told his sister something because his sister and i are pretty close and she reached out to me she's like hey sis you know yeah you know, who might get out soon? Just now, I think he was up for an appeal and stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, I don't want no part of it, right? And, uh, but then like, but I, in hindsight, I think I was uh, avoiding, right? I'm like yeah. avoiding and, and like uh, feeling tense because I was like, oh man, this is going to be a whole wall of like a, a, a dam that's going to like let loose and flood out all these emotions. So um, yeah, and then, when I started writing it, it was, it was painful. And that's when I reached out to the sister. I was like, Hey, can, um, can, uh, I have his address. Cause, um, I, I, I wanted to apologize because I remember that he tried to call and I, I didn't. And I remember, and I had also become a mentor for, um, formerly incarcerated students on campus. Mm. And when I listened to their stories, I kept thinking about him and how, you know, if you just have somebody in your life, like there's hope. And I kept thinking, man, I wonder who's there for Vu, right? I know his family, his sis sisters occasionally visit, but I remember that his parents had stopped visiting because it was too painful for him, you know, for them, I'm sorry, for them. They're like, it was too sad to, to leave every visit. And so they stopped coming. And his sister was like, oh, he's in a dark place. And I just, oh, it was just so painful. So um, yeah, so I wrote him, I was like, Hey, do you remember me? <laughs> it's your ex from 1992. <laughs> yep. And that's 2018, you said. That was 2018. Yep. And I cannot imagine leaving my son <laughs> because it's so painful, leaving him in there to rot and to not go visit him. That would just be, it's terrible terrorizing to think about that that thought yeah. mm. so yeah. so you start writing him and things start to sort of like um you guys get closer what's the frequency of the letters and how do you kind of structure all of this sort of closeness again um it, it, it started to be one letter a week like i would write and he would write and then that week i'd write again so it was like almost weekly letters. And then, and then I was like, can I come visit? <laughs> like, so then I went to go see him, you know, I got on a plane and, and visited him. Um, again, I was on sabbatical. So I had like flexibility. It was, um, it was October, his birthday's today, my birthday's in a couple of weeks. So I was like, oh, it's for our birthday. And man, when I saw him again, it was just like, everything from 1992, 1997, like it just all like came back, right? And everything that I 
that we, he and I didn't process then just like came out. Right. And, and so, um, you know, I've grown, he himself had grown while in prison. Um, I got to know him and he's, he's different, but he's the same. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of parts of ourselves that, that are remain, but we've learned from things. He has, he taught me so many things, um, about solitude, about, um, about, uh, reflection, about, uh, pain, uh, you know, about how to deal with like negative people because he's around negative people all the time. Right. And I'm like, how do you stay so positive? He's like, Oh, let me tell you about that. Right. And so, um, yeah, we just grew so close. And I, I remember like, Oh my God, am I, am I still in love with this dude? You know? Wow. And, and, and he, and he would tell his sisters, like, I mean, his sisters would know, like, he's always loved you. He never stopped loving you. And then I remember one letter, he's like, the, the love never died, at least for me anyway. But, you know, our circumstances are, I'm going to still be in here a long time. And if I get out, at that time when we wrote, he still had nine years left. He's like, if I get out, I'm still deportable. So he has a detainer for deportation, right? He's like, I don't think we could ever physically be together he's like but I'll love you from a distance and I was like oh, God. you know like I always like I always loved you and I'm like Ugh, right um so you you know the heart is just a man it's, it's yeah so yeah I like so did, well did, did you guys officially get back together while he was in or you guys just sort of understood the practicality of that and said all right we could just agree to love each other and that you just left it at that. Yeah. He, 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 again, he helped me learn so much. He said, you know, um, well, yes, I, I, you know, I was like, I, I still love you. Right. I still had these feelings. I was flying to visit him. We would talk on the phone. Sometimes we would be on, like on the phone for hours and his sister would be like, what do y'all talk about? I'm like, Oh, anything and everything. Right. But how can um, you talk to him while he's in jail? Oh, they get calls, kid. <laughs> like, how does that work? Uh, so you you can pay for like minutes, right? And on your account. And then um, they could either call you collect and you pay for the minutes or they can have their account and they'll call. And 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 it, it's 30 minutes per call. And then when you they hang up on you, you can call back again. And the, like they are allotted that amount of time i mean you can mm -hmm. talk for hours while you're in jail some days yeah and again he probably had a lot of clout he was already in 20 something years so like nobody's like busting him to get off the phone you know like there's only limited number of phones but if you you know if you have respect in there people won't be bugging you to get off the phone wow yeah and and you know like again that's probably why he didn't want to leave he had some status there i remember this one time he called he likes to sing, you know, it's our karaoke days. And he was singing me a song. <laughs> and then like, it got noisy in the back and he turned around and then I heard, I heard it like a little muffle. He's like, hey, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to sing to her. Because like, <laughs> he got quiet. And then he's like, continues the song. <laughs> it was the most romantic thing, Ken. <laughs> no, it sounds so sweet. <laughs> but, but you know, what exists, um, is that sort of that light and darkness, the contrast of sort of like an educated woman who's free versus this dark space, this criminal or, you know, somebody who's doing time. And just that the difference of, of your life and his life is what's so fascinating to me. Well, it's that difference. And yet at the core of us, right? And like, this is why I think like our histories and our experiences where we're younger if we don't know if we don't reflect and we don't know what to do with them you know they end up resurfacing and that's exactly what happened to us like these we, we never got to talk about like the the challenges that we had even as a couple when we were young right and then like the lifestyle and where that led us and how he was we talk about like what if i was what if i was able to convince him not to do it right but he was, or, or not to, or, or to, to not like take the fall. And he, there were so many what ifs. He's like, well, I don't know if you would have gotten where you've gotten, right? Like, mm -hmm. what if I held you back? Because, 
you would have been still trying to hang on to whatever life he was hanging on to. Yeah. And so there's a letter where he's like, if, if your success was the result of me having to do time, like I'll do it again. Right. And I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> it kind of, it really kind of like, if you think about it. Mm, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're love. different today, but, but our hearts were, are, are still, you know, it was very similar. similar. What did your mom, what did your mom and dad think? Like, well, the connection and how did they feel? You know, my parents were very interesting. And I, I don't, I think other Vietnamese parents, when you, when I talk to my parents, and if it's anybody like I'm, it's a guy, I'm like, oh, bang, bang, like, you know? Right. And, and, and so uh, I would bring it up to them. I'm like, hey, mom, do you remember the bang, like, Silla? And then this and my mom's like, oh yeah, I remember that guy. He had that raspy voice. He has a very distinguishable voice. And uh being like can can, right? I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah that's him, right? And and I said, yeah, no, 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 and and tell me yeah, no con chung dog, you know, um con you know like bang right bang lam bang lo, you know, and uh um, you know, con tới thăm nó tay tội nó, you know, nó có ai hết ba má nó hết thăm nó and 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 my, my mom and my dad are like very they've always been um they've always taught me to like don't look down on people help people if you can my parents help a lot of people like people coming in and out of the house living with us so they're like oh yeah yeah you bloody you know go làm bạn cho nó vui you know tội nghiệp nó this and that so they're like yeah go visit him go write him go call him you know like but and then towards the end that my mom's like bắt con yêu nó hả uh, maybe you know, mm, okay <laughs> my parents are very understanding and at that at some point did they say stop it no 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 they were completely like open to like visiting this person and being in love and then did at some point did you tell your mom I that mean, i'm in love the, i mean look at like like my uncle, he got out in 2017, I think. So he did about 15 years. So I think they have a re they have a relativity of like mm -hmm. it's not that bad in the family that had that that had that happen to them. And then Tuan is our other, you know, our other friend. And like my parents loved him when he was still like, you know, part of our our our, our friends and family. And my parents are always like, oh, you know, God, his poor parents having to like, mm. you know, have their son in prison and. And uh, so my parents are very empathetic people and um, whether like love or not, friendship or not, my parents are like, just be good to people. Like, oh, you want to help him? Go ahead, help him. Like, you want to write him? Go ahead. You know, you should go visit him because maybe he does need somebody to talk to, right? And but when it comes to love, you know, I think 20 years ago, they would have been like, hell no, right? Yeah. But, um, but I've always done my own thing you know um when it comes to um relationships so just i just they just support it that way so you you reconnect and you're falling in love by 2018 19 you said mm -hmm. and so this is now taking over your heart mind and soul right you're you're in this at this point i'm in it i'm in it um but he kept telling me he's like and I was struggling. I was like, man, do I want to be a prison girlfriend? You know, like I got a life out here, it's kind of hard, you know? So I had the struggle of loving someone. And then I kept thinking, is this like nostalgia? Is that I feel bad for him? Is it this the past? Like, shouldn't I move on? Like, you know, like what's the past? What's the pres present? And like, how do I, um, you know, reconcile like, um, this um this 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 difference between us right and and also kind of like i'm not gonna lie like fear of like reputation what do you mean you love someone in prison what's wrong with you like why would you why would you be in love with a uh, a person in prison um especially when you're a professor and like all that stuff that you you know you brought up so it was like a, i would go back and forth and then, you know, there were guys outside that like would pursue me. And so I was like, I don't know what to do. And 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 Vu told me, he said, um, I love you unconditionally, which means 
that while I'm inside, you do whatever you need to do, right? One day when I get out, I'm gonna come after you. And then you have like, I'm not gonna make you make a decision, but you'll know that I'm there. So what you decide to do is what you decide to do. Um, and he said, if you, if you end up meeting someone else, because I know you will, because you know, you got a lot going for you. Um, as long as I'm boyfriend number one, <laughs> I'm good with that, right? I was like, okay. And I thought about that, right? So I did meet this guy, super nice guy. Like we were friends for a while. Um, I'd been married before, was divorced, and I knew him from my 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 ex husband, and um, we connected. And he and so I was like, you know what? I don't know, man, because I'm not sure if you want to get involved with me. And I was very truthful. I was like, there's this guy, this other guy. He's incarcerated, you know. And this guy was like, oh, um, wow, I, you know, that's he 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 listened to the story. He was like, that's powerful. He's like, you're such a, you know, you're, this is a beautiful story. He's like, look, I'm not going to make you choose. I really like you. Like, let's try this. You never know where life will take us. Like, it could be, you know, uh, maybe he's the love of your life. Maybe I could be the love of your life, you know, but you don't know. And I'm okay with you loving him in there. And I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> like, okay, let me try this thing out, right? So I was dating him telling him about when Boo would call me, then I would tell Boo like, oh yeah, we went out, you know, this and that, and I still love you. And he's like, hey, and he would go, he would, get, he would get on the phone. He's like, so how's boyfriend number two, right? I'm like, oh, he's good, this and that. <laughs> and I remember at Christmas time, the guy on the outside was like, hey, do you want me to drive you to the prison to, to visit Boo? And I was like, I'm not gonna make you drive three hours and sit in the parking lot for four hours it's like basically a seven, eight hour day. And he's like, it's okay. I'll, I'll bring a book and I'll read. <laughs> like, oh my God, right? That's how much love he had for him. And then Vu was like, I don't want you guys to waste your time, you know, coming to visit me. He's like, you should spend time with them. And then when you're free by yourself, you can come visit me. And I was like, okay. So they were just like, you know, and Vu and, and would tell his sister, I can't hate the guy. Like yeah. he's good to her. You know, I just want her to be happy. If he makes her happy, so I was just like, it was crazy. And I was like, literally did not know what to do. I was, sometimes I feel selfish when I think back about it. Like, why didn't I, why didn't I, why, why would I do that? Why did I um, date two people at once or be with two people at once? And, 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 you know, Boo would always tell me, he's like, hey, it's your circumstance. Like, what would anybody else do? Mm -hmm. If you, if your heart is with somebody, but they're incarcerated. And a lot of people, a lot of women would probably look at me and be like, you're freaking selfish. Like I stood by my man. I did not need anybody outside, you know? Yeah. And maybe, maybe <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm still trying to process that. You know, it's complicated, man. It's complicated. It's complicated. <laughs> But this has a very uh, tragic ending, right? Well, yes. Oh, man. So in 2020, um, you know, um, things weren't working out for me and, and the other person. And, and, you know, for different reasons, uh, don't need to get into details. But we, we you know, we decided that we um, weren't going to continue as like a couple or dating or whatever. And at that time, I was like, you know, I've already, uh, I don't think I need anyone outside anymore. And I was like, you know, I have so much going on. I've got this book I need to write. I've got this film that I'm, I'm working on. I've got my full-time job. I'm in many ways trying to um, be in a relationship is, is, is work and energy and, and, you know, I don't need the troubles and the headaches because there were some challenges, right? Um, so when we broke up, I talked to Vu and I um, and I said, you know, let me let's just try this. Let me just I want to try to be with you, Bob, of only you. Mm. And um, I I gave this thing, this other thing, a chance, and you were so gracious and grateful and and open and supportive. And I want to give um, I want to just be with you. And, and then, you know, we're going to try to keep every year, like fighting for your early release, try to change laws in Texas that would have like given them early parole. 
and let's just try. Um, and he's like, he's all happy. He's like, so there's only one boyfriend then? I'm like, yep, just you, right? And then the pandemic hit. And um, so we had this plan to have this visit together and that didn't go through. I, the, I saw him in January of 2020. That's when we had this conversation, right? Uh, and uh, by March, everything shut down. So I didn't get to visit him. I was gonna go visit during spring break. And then they like cut off phone calls because you know it was now like hard to get on the phones, social distancing, cleaning and all that. So they put him on lockdown and he was getting like a one, minute, one five minute phone call like every week or something. So he'd have to like, I'm like, hey, call your family, you know? And then I would talk to him maybe other, every other week. And then the letters were difficult because there was a disruption in mail. And so a letter would take, that usually took a week to come was taking three weeks to come, right? And so it was just, it was just very difficult. But I was like, it's fine, you know, like, we. We made it through 20 something years of separation this last two years of trying to figure ourselves out and um, it's not gonna phase me, right? Like when this pandemic's over, we'll still, we, we will get to start anew. And then, um, and then in July, he got sick. And it was, a, it was a really tough battle with like prison medical. And I know that he was probably sick since like April, like May, he started feeling certain pains. And you know, prison medical is like, it's exactly what it's exact. His, this experience was exactly what you hear. They neglect you, they don't care. They think you're lying, they think you're faking it. They give you ibuprofen, tell you to go go away. And and then your, your illness can get worse and worse. And so he collapsed. And they sent him to the ER outside of the prison because they didn't have a, a they don't have a full medical um, thing at the at the unit, and they couldn't figure out what's wrong. So then they finally, after he collapsed, after he lost thirty pounds, right in a month, um, on the floor, uh, cre crying, screaming, you know, they finally um, sent him to a specialist at the prison hospital. And it was July 16th that he called me and he's like, hey, babe, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to the hospital finally, but my foot is swollen, my back hurts, my stomach hurts, I got all this pain, I can't eat, you know, it's, it's hard for me to sleep, I can barely walk, like, it was, it was sounding awful. And, um, and I remember he said, hey, I read in the Houston Chronicle about this woman who had stomach cancer. And he's like, I think I have stomach cancer. And I was like, no, stop. Like, you know, you probably have kidney stones or some like kidney thing. And, you know, you just, I was like, no, 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 no. So he goes to the hospital the next day, July 17th. And then four days later, the, 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 um, the doctor called and um, said he had pancreatic cancer, stage four, stage four. And I. <sighs> the worst of them all pancreatic oh yeah like the one of the deadliest right and i was like Fuck, he's gonna die and 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 if it's not in one year it's five years like the longest like that people have lived from pancreatic cancer like five years right and i'm like he still has seven left he's gonna die in prison um yeah that's that's yeah but Never to be, you know, always to be a fighter. I was like, okay, fine. I'm going to try and get him out. I, re I remember reading about like medical parole that if someone's diagnosed with less than six months to live, you could, you could petition to have them come home to be released. Um, it's called compassionate release. Mm -hmm. And so I started researching the process and, and it would, and, and, but then the doctors gave him a diagnosis of less than one year to live. So he didn't qualify for compassionate release. So then I went and looked and his family talked to some lawyers and we found a, a, a team of lawyers who said, well, we can, we can file for a writ of habeas corpus, which is like, uh, because of COVID, you know, they can do early release. He's a, he's a high risk, you know, he's got cancer. Uh, we would get in front of a judge and then the judge could like, you know, approve. Um, it was going to cost $40,000. <laughs> and I was like, Okay. And you know, the family was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna put the money together and we're gonna do this. And I, I got, I got a call from him 
got one rare phone call and I said, hey, this is what we're going to do. Your family's going to do this. We're going to get you a lawyer. And I remember him just like, man, I don't know. I just don't want to do that to my family. Right? Like they already spent so much money on me, like for my first case. And he felt a lot of guilt. And I was like, hello, we're trying to save your life so that you could like be home with them, you know, one last time. Uh, but he, but that's him. He's always thinking about, he's about to die. Okay. He's got this death diagnosis and he's like, oh, I just don't want to do that to my family, you know? And, um, and so I said, okay, well, I'll ask him for some help. <laughs> and so his sister was like, can you, can you, can you set up a GoFundMe? And I said, I absolutely will. Um, but I also use that opportunity to like, um, I wanted to people, I wanted people to know why we were asking for help. And I had written this one version that was very angry. It was a very angry version of like angry at GE for what he did, angry at the system, angry at cancer, angry at just pissed off, right? And like, please help me, please help the family. And um his sister read it. And she's like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know, sis. This is like, mm -hmm. this is not, this is not you. You know, you're not like this. Um, she's like, I want to know what I really want to know is like, why do you love my brother so much? Because mm. <laughs> you know? she's thinking the same thing too. Like here's Tao over here and my brother over here. Why does she love him? Why would she do all this for him? Um, so that's how I, um, that's how I presented the story. Please help this family because this is a, uh, this man is um, a beautiful person and I just want to give him this last gift. Um, this last gift uh, to um, if he's going to die, please don't let him die alone in prison. Let him die uh, with his family uh, by his side. Right. That's how I wrote it. <sighs> and um, the community was incredible. Like people started sharing like random strangers were giving, family were giving, friends were giving, all the old homies, right, that knew him were like, oh my God, I didn't, I know who went away, but I didn't know this was happening to him, right? And so they gave, um, they gave a lot and they gave quickly. And so we were able to hire the attorneys. Um, but the tragic thing is he didn't, he didn't make it, right? So the week, before we were supposed to get a trial, a hearing, um, he, I mean, you know, it was just ravaging him. Um, I got a FaceTime with him about four days before he passed. And like the, it, the, the cancer had gotten into his skin. He was itchy. He couldn't walk. Um, he was like bedridden. Um, it was in his bones. It was in his um, liver. It was in his kidney. It was in his throat, like his lymph nodes. It was gotten his brain. He couldn't read anymore. He couldn't um, write anything. Like the nurses were reading the letters to him, right? These kind, compassionate nurses. So um, yeah, it, it, it ravaged him. And, and he just, I mean, his body couldn't take it anymore. So it was about like nine weeks um, that he had passed away from his diagnosis. Since the, since the diagnosis. That was yeah. fast. Yeah. A lot faster than I thought. I was like, you know what? Maybe he has six months. And then we got this oncology report from the from the um, expert witness that we hired, and he's like, this man, this man, has a month, maybe weeks left. And based on that, um, it was about a week later that he had passed away. Wow. <laughs> so. Once that happens, um, you know, the family picks up the body and they bring the body out of prison. Then is there a funeral process that happened after that? Mm -hmm. We um, had a funeral. Um, you know, we had enough funds um, from the, the, the GoFundMe and the, the donations um, to give him a very beautiful ceremony, burial. Um, G showed up, right, to the funeral. 
Oh, wow. And uh, I wanted to go smack him. <laughs> and I and I went to one of Vu's brothers. And I was like, he's here. And LT was there. LT showed up too. And I saw LT. I was like, what is he doing here? And he's like, well, what do you, mm-hmm. you know? And I was like, you know, seething with anger. And then um, Vu's brother came to me and he's like, you know, Tao, we talked to, you know, Vu, Vu, Vu has always said he forgave Vu, Chai. He's like, I forgive him. I'm not bitter. Like, yeah. I own this. Like, I don't blame him at all. And I forgive him. At first, I was angry. First, I was hating on him. But, you know, you learn after a period, like, that does nothing for you. So he's forgiven tree. And so his brother said, you have to remember, if Vu can forgive him, then we can forgive him. I was like, okay, I'm forgiving him for Vu. I'm not going to go over there and cause a scene. Um, but yeah, had a funeral, had a burial. It was well attended. People, you know, people love his family. People remember him. Um, and it was, it was, it was beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that um, beautiful journey with me. Uh, I'm sure it's, it, it's not easy to go back and revisit these points, these fine points um, of your journey with Vu, but it's a beautiful story. I mean, and, and here's why it's beautiful to me. It's beautiful because- Don't make me cry again. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know we're crying anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. It's beautiful to me because, um, you know, not all of the things that happen in our life um, go smoothly and beautifully what we think they that it will. But listening to the pain and the struggle of all of these last few years for you, um, I'm not sure if, let's just say you just got married, you know, five years, 10 years ago, you got out and you know, he, he's your husband and you live a life where there's, you know, you go grocery shopping and <laughs> mundane things happen and that the, the significance of something like this, um, doesn't happen. You know, tragedy brings these beautiful poignant sort of moments in our life that, um, are invaluable, right? Like, like an everyday husband, everyday wife. I mean, you know, go on, but, you know, and the fact that, you know, the mercy and forgiveness that he could show tree, um, is a, is a, a beacon of light to just enlightenment. You know, it, it takes a lot to, to not be angry at somebody like that. It takes a, a whole lot of, um, if you think about it, like the time somebody's pondered like about life and going, you know, let that go. I mean, you're fucking dying in prison because you made a decision to back this random guy up. And then now you've come to grips with like, it's all over, like, let it go. And there's such uh, a beautiful story in, in this somehow. Mm-hmm. I remember asking him one time in a letter, how can you be so um how can you be such so full of light in such a dark place Mm. you know and he called me on the phone and we had a conversation about it and he said well you can choose um you can choose to be part of the darkness um and it's actually more comfortable right because it's um it's the common thing for people to be bitter or dark. Um, and he said, but I think about my loved ones. I think about my family. I think about you. And he's like, even in my situation, I'm blessed wow. because I have, I have love. He right? says, so come back to love again. You know, it's like, my sisters love me. A lot of these guys don't have any love. A lot of these guys have wives, but they don't, those, their wives don't love them or they don't love their wives. He's like, he said, you came back into my life, like, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, and even before I came back, he was like, um, just did not want to live a 
full of pain and anger and rage. And I think it had, and he said that um, reading helped him a lot. Um, reading um, books. And, and when he passed away, I, I, I got a lot of his property. His, his family kept some of his property and I got some too. And then, so I got his book collection <clears throat> and he has love, love poems and uh, books about like uh, love letters. And then he has these, um, this one book called The Seat of the Soul. It was about the evolution of the soul. Who wrote right? it? And, hmm? Who wrote Seat of the Soul? Oh gosh, Gary. Gary, yeah. yeah. Gary Zakov or something like yeah, that. Gary Zakov. Yeah. That that's yes. like one of Oprah's like favorite books. Yes, yes. That was in his book collection, right? So that's this is that's the kind of uh, person that he wanted to be. You know, person full of love, person who was evolving, person who was growing. And mind you, like he did not get access to education, so this was all self-taught. Um, in Texas, if you are um, incarcerated with a detainer for deportation, you don't get access to like classes or, or, or uh, you know, school because they're like, why would we invest in you when you get out, you're going to be deported. So he was ineligible for everything. Um, so this was, you know, these were his, this was his self-taught journey. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. He's, he's, he's a, a He's a very beautiful person, which is why I fell in love with him uh, from the beginning and why I wanted to still uh, be with him. Um, and, you know, I started on my memoir writing about him, which is why I got into this whole journey in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think that what you said is very precious because in the first version of the memoir, when I had finished the draft, you know, he was still around and so i'm revising it and i'm rewriting it now and i think it's got a bigger message it's not just about being in a gang and growing up tough and hard and getting shot blah, blah. okay so yes those things are significant right but it's this um transformation of Vu and how he transformed me when i thought that i was yeah made it right or successful or whatever um so yeah, it's a different story and I want to shine light on, you know, our Vietnamese brothers and sisters who are behind bars and the struggles of that and the tragedies that come with that and, but why they're, you know, why, why would we see them as monsters, right? How can we humanize them? How can we show love and compassion. Um, because even if, even if you just decide that you're gonna see them as monsters, they're coming back to our community. I mean, tragically not who, but we know men, lots of men and women are coming out of prison. And what will we do with these individuals? Are we going to, they've done their time, right? Tuan did his time. Um, he's giving back to society now. I work with formerly incarcerated students every day and they are some of the most giving compassionate, empathetic people that I've ever worked with because they know what it was like to be rock bottom and they were shown love, right? It kind of goes back to my parents. They showed me love. You know, Vu's light was because his family loved him. These students feel accepted, um, cared for, supported. Um, so, you know, I want to I wanna revise, you know, I'm revising the book, um, to have a, a different type of message. It it inspires me to think about like when you suck everything out of this vacuum of life and you know, you, the material shit, the money, just you zap it out, social media, all of the distractions and you just like a vacuum sealed um, space. And if you're left with love, I, I, I feel like, um, all of the practicalities and all of the sort of the measured uh, the metrics of life and it, it can all go away if you have love in in any situation whether it's dark or you're happy with your life or you're not happy but if you have love and you have the support from your family or your mom and dad or your your kids and that's at the end of the of the day what what drives us as as human beings and makes us stable um, and I think that going through life and um, 
having this existence where you know you just trudge along and you're just kind of like uh, every every day is happening but to to experience something that you experience with vu um although tragic it, it's like this sort of journey that allowed you to take a really good deep introspective sort of look at 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 the the journey of love and mercy and somebody who sounds like they got a chance to become enlightened uh in prison mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. i there's like four other topics that i thought that we would get into you know um <laughs> it, it it requires its own uh episode with you because sea drift is something that is massive uh, to me uh your project that um you know the documentary project project that you produced um teaching your 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 whole background in teaching and sociology is something that i'm very interested in discussing and um of course there's vala uh and its importance in your life and my life and i wanted to talk about all these things so i think we kind of wrap it i'm i'm gonna have to like force ourselves to kind of leave the vu topic uh right where it's at and and mm -hmm. kind of simmer in that uh for the rest of the day for me but when it comes to sea drift teaching and vala uh those three things i would love to talk about in equal proportions but i think w our time is limited and um i want to milk as much uh uh <laughs> conversation as i can from you um so <laughs> what would you like to speak about out of those three sea drift uh your teaching life right now or the importance of vala um, I, want, I want to take a chance. I want to take an opportunity to pitch Vala. Uh, there, it, it's time sensitive. I want to use this platform. Um, and I can weave in the other two because of Vala. So let me talk a little about Vala, Vietnamese American Arts and Letters Association. And they are a, a, a group of um, um, incredible leaders in the Orange County um, area and uh, use arts and, and letters writing uh, to empower uh, the community and to um, uh, highlight like the, the cultural fabric of, of, of Vietnamese American life and, and Vietnamese everywhere. So uh, we hold um, art events, um, uh, book events. Uh, we try to uh, nurture uh, aspiring artists, filmmakers. We have event um, programs. Uh, where we mentor youth in in artistry and photography and filmmaking um and so my role is a board member and i was brought on only a couple of years ago but i had always gone to avala events and i would donate money and you know like i just loved um, the energy of see, of being around my community and to see us doing something other than being a doctor, a lawyer, and engineer, right? No, no hate on those folks. Um, you know, y'all are doing um, great things too. Uh, but there's something about the aesthetics that I think brings an um, uh, an element of that's really important right now, which is everyone's talking about representation, right? Whether it's representation in political bodies, representation in the media, representation in storytelling representation in, in the in, in our existence right and so i love vala because we get to put the platforms out there for people of our communities to um to show their rep show our representation and um one of our biggest events is vietnamese or vit film fest and that's uh 12 years running now and yeah it's a film festival we've had to um you know, cut it down to like virtual last year. But before that, you know, we rent out a, a theater in Orange County and showcase all these films that are Vietnamese related, right? So they're Vietnamese directors or producers or the right. stories. Um, and, and that's coming up, right? So October 15th to October 30th, this year, 2021, we're running a Vit Film Fest uh, virtually and two uh, in-person drive-in screenings. Uh, so yeah, check out Vietnamese American Arts and Letters Association uh, uh, website and Viet Film Fest. Um, it, it's some good stuff if you want to see the stories being told from from our community. You know, why? And of course, I know why for me. But why is it important to have a Vietnamese film festival in the world? Um. 
you know, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's definitely a barrier and there are definitely um, gatekeepers in uh, the, the media world. And if we did not host this kind of event, we wouldn't be, where would our budding emerging filmmakers go? Um, you know, these unique stories um, also give an opportunity for our community to see young people, emerging filmmakers, people like yourself and your, your, the, 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 the friends that you have in your circle in the industry, right? An opportunity to be the mentors, to be the role models, to say you can do this as a living. You can uh, 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 highlight your talents in, 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 a, in an artistic way um, and that there's value in it, right? And that there's um, real impact so we have to have a Vietnamese film festival because it's uh, it brings community together, it highlights our representation, but it gives opportunity and it um, and it gives um, young people a chance to see that uh, others like them are doing these things. So you had touched upon um, this project Sea Drift, and you're like, all right, let's just fold it into the conversation with yeah. Mala. So can you tell me your involvement with um, Sea Drift? Yeah. So in my teaching, you know, I chose sociology, and when I was in graduate school or even in undergrad, my teachers were like very encouraging about me studying our own community, my own community. Um, you know, I remember going to class, and there were no other Vietnamese taking like you know, that were sociology majors or psychology or even history, right? I have one friend who's a historian, Vietnamese American historian in Texas. So it's him and me, that's it, right? Like during our yeah. generation. Um, and I'm gonna have you bring him on the show, he's cool. So- I'd love to meet him. Uh, so we, um, you know, so I, I was, I had this whole history of our people, our community in Texas to write about. So I wrote about nail salons. I wrote about the fishermen and the shrimpers because that was such a significance in, in the number of people who were doing that type of work. And it had to do with like immigrant assimilation and economic assimilation and these sociological things. But then as I would uncover more of the story, there were a lot of bias, discrimination, racism. So Sea Drift was a, a, a part of the research about Vietnamese shrimpers in Texas and the, the racism that, that existed and the racial tensions, but also the labor tensions that were happening in all of the Gulf Coast towns, all these little towns where Vietnamese were moving to, to become fishers and shrimpers and crabbers. And I've written about it. Um, this one particular incident in Sea Drift was, uh, was important to the history because um, the tension led to like violence. Um, there was a shooting, someone was killed. Vietnamese um, a refugee killed a, the, the, a white man and it became this racial tension. The KKK came to town. Um, there was a lawsuit, uh, like there were boat burnings. Um, and so I'd written about that and, and the filmmaker, uh, Taiwanese American came across the story and he's like, oh my God, I had never, I'd studied Asian American history. I studied, I took classes in Asian American experience and I'd never heard of this mm -hmm. event. And it was such a major event to hear like the KKK going after Vietnamese and then the Vietnamese fighting back, right? Um, and so he reached out to me and he's like, I wanna make a documentary about this. I was like, oh, that's cool. You know, I was like busy in my, my, my teaching life. And so I was like, yeah, okay, whatever, whatever you need me from me. And so because he's Taiwanese American, he did need a lot of access. Uh, right. language, interpretation, just rapport with the Vietnamese people in the community who experienced it 30 years ago and really weren't really willing to talk about it. Um, and he asked me, he's like, how did you get them to talk about it? And I said, well, I went down there and I was like, oh, I'm a student and I need this for a school project. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, okay, school? Yes, I'll tell you everything, <laughs> right? He's like, can you kind of do the same thing? I was like, oh, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> You know, so I'm like, oh, my school project is going to be a movie. Can you like talk to this man, you know? And he, eventually my dad got involved. He became an interpreter because he was the same age as some of these um, people now. So uh, it came, became like a little family project. But it, it became this film, uh, came out in 2019. 
it got a lot of good recognition. Um, it's been through the festivals and, and then it was um, a highlight for me to have it shown at VIT Film Fest in 2019. So wow. Wow. full circle. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what is the life of a movie like that? What, what happens to it? It, does it go away? I mean, how does it live and how do we see it? Um, so it, it, it's currently, um, you can get it on Amazon. Uh, you can watch it on iTunes. Um, so uh, they're streaming. It was on PBS um, in 2020, I think. And then last year, last year uh, or earlier this year during the um, AAPI hate um, um, incidences and the Stop Asian Hate, they featured it for a month for free on PBS. So, you know, there's like access to it. Um, people have still, you know, people still contact us now to like have us give talks. People are showing it at schools. People are showing it at um, community events. Um, the city of Fort Worth had just recently showed it uh, over the summer for their cultural series. Um, next Tuesday, I'm, I'm giving a talk to the Security and Exchange Commission about uh, sea drift and about being Vietnamese in Texas. So uh, there's, um, I think a lot of people um, want to talk about what happened and, and where we are now because of refugees, racism. How do you reconcile, you know, how do you, how do communities forgive and for, or like heal, right? From those incidences and what can we learn from them? And I think that's the message from the story, from, from the film. So random, the SEC, like people from the- Yeah, SEC. Security and Exchange Commission. And I'm like, what why are you interested? Do? And they're yeah, like, well, we do a cultural, we do a cultural series every month, like a series of cultural talks every month. And last month they had somebody, a professor come talk about the Tulsa massacre massacre mm -hmm. in, in uh, Wall Street, uh, you know, Black Wall Street. And he's like, and so the director of the Southern District of the SEC, he's in Dallas and he said, oh, I came across Sea Drift. I thought it was so interesting. And, you know, I wanted to put this on as the cultural event for this month. So it's going to be recorded and, or it's going to be on Zoom. And uh, I guess they're showing it throughout the SEC offices, you know, like for employees to watch wow. and stuff. So it's a good way and, and it, so come back full circle of like representation, right? Like how else will these folks hear our stories if we're not putting them out and putting them in film? I wrote the book, I wrote the chapter in the book like in 2007, Ken. So it's been out there, but nobody reads academic books you know mm -hmm. um except other academics so it wasn't until tim Tsai made the film that now more and more more people are hearing it which is why i'm so committed to writing this book too this memoir because all my life i've been writing like academic work and i think it's time to put something in a little bit more public space like public writing i have to make a decision all the time about who what what guests we bring on and and yada 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 like there's that decision all the time you know move heavily into pop culture move heavily into you know there's so many different angles you know business podcasts and all but one thing that is very very underserved and i need help here is the vietnamese academics all around the world because mm -hmm. what i'm learning now after talking to you kimberly k um a lot of professors have um, books or movies that they are putting out. Um, we need to just continue amplifying this perspective, which is our perspective, and making it normalize. So then by the time, you know, my children, these young kids grow up, it is completely normal uh, to be Vietnamese without the conversation about war. Like, mm. Mm. Right? We're, we're like this own existing group of like powerful Southeast Asian Vietnamese uh, group that it's just like we're normalized into a culture of uh, whatever we're known for, whatever we're proud of. And we're just human beings. I mean, we're, I mean, there was like some difference between like you know, all of the little nuances, but at the same time, we should be just normal. We should just be able to come to the stage, the world stage and have our, you know, we have our, our films, we have our entertainment, just like the Korean culture, just like the American 
culture free from like this trauma or mm -hmm. talk of war. And I think that's mm -hmm. sort of, I would love to hear more um, academics uh, talk about their research and talk about their work. And, um, you know, the, the, the historian that you know, I, I'm very mm -hmm. curious about bringing on um, academics uh, in PhDs that talk and write about different aspects of, of Vietnamese uh, global history. Will do. I know a lot of them. <laughs> There's only a few of us, though. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So yeah, we'll we'll, we'll definitely get into that. And um, okay. I I want to thank you for spending time and open. Um, you know what sounds to be a difficult thing to talk about, but you've managed to articulate your story with Vu in such a beautiful and eloquent way. Oh, thank you. Hopefully, I can write it in the same way. <laughs> I have no um, no doubt that you'll you'll knock that out of the park. <laughs> Thank you. And I look forward to it. I mean, once you're done with the book, we can get back on and and talk about you know the journey of of putting that together. Awesome. Thank you. I, be right. I better get on it. I better hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. We look forward to Thank it. You, Thanks Ken. again. Thank you for listening to the Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran and Javier Proenza. Special thanks to Jane Wynn, Catherine Wynn, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts. Thanks again for listening.